At this point, we've been really, really pro market throughout the entire semester here, looking at this information, especially when we're looking at the uh, the pricing system is set up in a market economy and the efficiency of that. But this unit, uh, unit 3.3 here, this video, we're going to look at how sometimes the markets fail to allocate efficiently uh, and we call these market failures. So when the market fails to act efficiently with the market forces alone and we have to do something else to correct that, that situation, that is a market failure. So we're going to look at the causes of market failures. We're going to look at the role government plays within market failures. And then finally, take the opportunity to talk about wages and uh, unions as well. So we got a lot of information here. I'm going to try to fly through this and fit this all in one video. So let's get going. So first of all, causes of market failures, we have four that we're going to look at here. Inadequate competition, inadequate information to start with. The first one here with competition, if you have oligopoly and monopoly uh, types type setups in a lot of industries, that creates some negative outcomes. Now, not to say we're going to make all oligopolies illegal, uh, because obviously that's not the case. We allow that to occur. But when it gets to the point where the consumer is getting taken advantage of and is paying uh, significantly higher prices and less of that uh, product is being distributed through transactions, that creates some major issues and some major inconsistencies with the market um, and it's not allocating correctly. So we try to cut that down as much as we can. We also try to make sure that especially our buyers, but also our sellers are educated in what they are buying and not being misled by other sides. So having taking steps to ensure that uh, proper information and knowledge and education, that's important as well. So that's two of them. The other two are externalities and public goods or the lack thereof. Uh, an externality is a side effect. Uh, so this neither benefits, uh, this is a benefit or a harm to a third party, meaning that you're not involved in the original transaction, but you're being affected nonetheless, either in a good way or in a bad way. So a positive externality is obviously going to be a good benefit. It's a benefit that you're receiving uh, from a decision. So if a government decides they're going to increase, you know, pedestrian or public transportation, that leads to a lot of things, uh, probably both positive and negative, but in a positive externality example, uh, that decreases pollution. So that wasn't necessarily the primary objective of that, but it did in, it indeed created that positive externality. And on the negative end, we can look at something like cigarette smoking and how it negatively impacts public health. And by uh, by creating situations to stop that, we can we can eliminate those negative externalities or at least limit them. Uh, but we want to we want to uh, create that. But I mean, you look at it, it's not the, the person involved in the transaction was the, the business that sold the cigarettes and the person that bought them. But other people are affected nonetheless. And then public goods are goods that are provided to the general public, consumed with by everyone and um, the consumption leading to no decrease in the satisfaction of others. And those are not provided in the free market alone. Uh, without a government to step in to create those public goods, we wouldn't have things like military, police, uh, fire protection, um, even public parks would be an example of something that just doesn't really get provided very efficiently in a free market alone. So having some entity to step in to create those is, is a positive for everybody. So those are four causes of market failures. Let's look at how the role, how government steps in to try to correct those those four causes and, and create situations there. So I think I have three of them here. Uh, first one thing is ensuring competition. So in the late 1800s, we had the robber barons, the, you know, the Carnegie's, the Rocker, Rockefellers that were, that were doing really well business wise, industrial revolution, really taking advantage of their power as a monopoly and, uh, and really being profitable as a result. But again, we want competition. It's the benefit to the consumer overall uh, to have that competition and they weren't getting it at that point. So there were laws passed, especially the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, to try to cut this down. Now, successfully, there wasn't those those original robber baron. Um, the only one that actually took any of the the negative from that would have been uh, Rockefeller with with the oil industry. And uh, and I'll get to that in 1911. Uh, he he was uh, he had to break up the company into several smaller regional companies as a result. And we saw a lot of examples of this throughout the next hundred years with adjustments to that those laws. Uh, AT and T has seen it multiple times with their in the 1980s. Microsoft had issues in the in the late 90s, early 2000s um, with it providing in internet explorer and not allowing competition in. Um, they were forced to make some changes as a result. AT&T was broken up into regional, 
um, companies as well. And then again, in 2011, we're forced to not be able to go through with the transaction to purchase T-Mobile because of their large market share that they would have had as a result. So there's been lots of uh, legislation passed to try to cut down on those, uh, any, any efforts to eliminate competition for the, from the market. Um, and then also made price discrimination discrimination illegal, charging different prices to different people for the exact same product with that. And then we got two others here, regulations. So this is just passing laws, uh, especially through, you know, you have laws for sure, uh, but also through taxes and subsidies to, to cut down on that. So we've talked about how with utility companies in particular, that monopolies are better for the collective because of the low production costs that they can take advantage of, but they need to be restricted through regulation to make sure they can't take advantage of those full price maker capabilities. Um, we talked about taxes and the impact of that, the shifts in supply. You can see an example of a carbon tax on the, on the right side of the screen there. Um, so that would be an example of a negative externality, creating a carbon tax to fight pollution. My example here, I'm looking at uh, tobacco. So creating sin taxes on alcohol and tobacco to decrease their consumption would actually show up as the same graph on there. Increasing the price of the product, but decreasing the quantity consumed. So efforts can be taken to, you know, through taxes and subsidies to either uh, increase the amount in the case of a positive externality or decrease the amount in the case of a negative. And then also just making sure that people are informed, creating agencies that are protecting consumers, things like the Food and Drug Administration or the Securities and Exchange Commission, other uh, organizations and agencies as well that are put in place to help inform the the, uh, the buyers uh, and make make. Uh, um, educated decisions. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to unions here, and we'll talk a little bit about wages as well. Um, so a trade union or a craft union, a different type, but we're going to keep it simple here. Uh, an association of skilled workers performing the same kind of work. Their their goal as an organization is to help the workers through collective bargaining to negotiate higher pay, job security, better hours, improved working conditions. These have, uh, you know, over the years, the goals have changed as it's gone from like unsafe working conditions to just trying to advocate for the, the worker and provide a more livable uh, situation for them. Um, but if agreements cannot be made, there are several different tactics that can be used by unions to uh, disrupt the production process and ultimately kind of get their way. Uh, things like strikes, picketing, boycotts, all of those things uh, would be examples of things that, that unions could take advantage of. You can see here the declining union membership over the years. So from 1964 on to the present, you can see how all those states, so many of those states are lightening up in color and the changes that are occurring over that time uh, during that. So you can see that Indiana goes down from about 40% to all the way down to like 16% by the end of 2012. And then finally looking at wages. Wage rates are determined through market forces, uh, so primarily through supply and demand, but there are some other factors such as skill levels, uh, education, union membership even may come into play uh, as, in terms of being able to make more as a union worker. Uh, but ultimately, the wages are set through the, what we call the market theory of wage uh, determination. So this theory states that supply and demand impact the, the wages. So there's going to be a low demand uh, and high supply in that kind of situation, that's going to indicate a low wage, something that a lot of people can do. Uh, and a lot of people are willing or, um, you know, there's just not much demand for that job. That's going to be that there's a lot of people that be willing to sit around all day and get paid, but that job's just not available. So there's no, no pay for it at all. Um, but goal, but jobs that are in high demand, uh, but with low supply, that's going to indicate a high wage. All right. So we're going to go into more details with these with these topics in class here. But I just wanted to kind of give you the overview of the information you need uh, moving forward through this unit. All right. Have a good one, guys.